Okay, First Corinthians 12. I um, what the what I felt like the Lord put on my heart just in as this maybe being like the last gathering at least for this term. I realize some of you will come back, but we'll be in a different style and going through the family project and all that kind of stuff. But I just felt like the Lord had placed it on my heart just for us tonight to be reminded real simply that we need every joint to supply. That we're all a part of the body of Christ and we're only one expression of the body itself as a whole. But we need every joint, every gift, everybody to supply what God has put in your heart. And I think if this is a little easier and maybe a little more palpable at life groups, but I'm even talking about services on Sunday where we are all together. I mean, it seems like we kind of get, this is just my perspective, if this is offensive, forgive me, but it seems like we kind of get it rolling and we're going and everybody's breathing and putting in their supply. Maybe because everybody feels more comfortable at life groups, but then we come to services and sit down or we don't participate or there isn't an active asking the Lord the same way you would here or what is it that you put in my heart? Is there anything that you would like me to share? Is there anyone who I could be praying for? You know, I know we have a prayer team at the church, but you're on the prayer team. You're it. If the Lord moves on your heart to share, you know what I mean? You don't need a badge. It's okay. So just, I just feel like the Lord real simply just wanted me um, just to go through this really, really awesome, really good scripture. I know you guys have heard it before. We're going to get through some verses tonight. And I just want to make four points about everybody being used of the Lord, of every joint supplying, and even specifically talking about spiritual gifts, which we're going to read. So whatever gifts you have, those things being used and being brought out and being for the benefit of others. So I want to start reading in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to cover a little bit of ground, and I'll break four times and make four points from there. If you want to interject or you have something you'd like to say or something you notice, please feel free. This is not a sermon. <clears throat> Verse 4, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord Jesus. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I want to read you real fast. This is just verses 6 and 7 of a Greek translation that really brings out, I think, the word itself. Verse 6, And there are different distributions of divine energy motivating these gifts in their operation. But the same God who by His divine energy operates them all in their sphere. Verse 7, But to each one there is constantly being given the clearly seen operations of the Spirit with a view to the profit of all. So that's a little different. That's good. <clears throat> Reading the Greek is like you've never read the Bible before because there's just some stuff that we miss. But to each one is constantly being given. It's constantly being supplied. The Holy Spirit is constantly constantly supplying these things to us which we need with a view to the profit, to the benefit of all. So the first thing that I wanted to point out simply is that every grace, every gifting, every talent, every skill set, everything that God has given you has been given to us for the express purpose of benefiting other people. Real simple. Everything that God has given you in your life, whether you can prophesy till the cows come home, whether you can, you're hospitable, you love to meet with people, or you care about the lost, all of those things, whatever they are, they're given for the benefit of other people. That is the basis of God giving gifts. It says, for the common good. This translation that I read to you says for the benefit or the profit of all. So the first thing is that it's given to us for others. And so 
when you see it in that light, for me, that changes things. And honestly, it convicts me that when I withhold, and I'm not talking about grabbing for the microphone and going nuts and, you know, ridiculousness, but a lot of times I think when we withhold, and I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but you've, like, started arguing with the Lord ongoing maybe in a service or you feel like He wants you to do something or He's, like, nudging you or leading you or especially if it involves going up front. I mean, good grief. Now we're really going to argue with the Lord and then before you know it, the service is over and you spend the afternoon thinking about how you didn't and you made all these kinds of excuses. And so seeing this in the light of this is given to me or whatever God reveals you, whatever He shows you, it obviously applies to your own life and your own heart, but it is for the benefit of others, and we can't lose sight of that. You know, if you have great revelation into the Scriptures and the Lord, it's not so you can just roll it around in your own mind and amuse yourself, so that you can share, so that you can teach others, so that you can be helpful, whatever it is that you have. So it's for other people. I want to keep reading and just start in verse 12. You can read the list of the gifts here. There's also other locations in Scripture if you'd like. I can tell you them after. Continuing on, this is verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is the Christ. Verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. <clears throat> Verse 15, If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for, the, for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. My translation of this is literally, if you think about what you are not, you will never give what you actually have. And Paul uses the example here of, just because you're an ear, you can't say, well, I'm not an eye. That doesn't not make you an ear. That doesn't invalidate your gifts. So probably the best and strongest example I could use because of the nature of heart of the Father and even Jeremiah's gifting is, well, I'm not prophetic, therefore I can't. Or therefore I, or God doesn't speak to me like that. Or I don't have two dreams a night like that. <laughs> I can't, or I won't, or I won't give forth. And so we end up comparing. This is the second point I want to make is that comparison kills. It always kills. It always does. It always distinct, extinguishes the life of God in your heart and what He's called you to when you start comparing yourself to others. It didn't work at the end of the book of John where they're like, hey, well, what about this guy? What about Matt? Don't worry about him. What is it that I do with him? It's none of your business. You follow me. Hmm. And so, hey, you can't prophesy. That's okay. The Lord will teach you how. If you can pray, you can prophesy. And you prophesy according to the measure of your faith. But as we're all growing and as we're all learning, you can't look at the greatest, the most anointed, all the chatter that's out there about whomever and then disqualify yourself. But the Lord put this in here because He knows that that's what we do. I was 15. I was riding in a car on the way to high school one morning, and I was discouraged, and I was thinking about, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And the Lord spoke to me and said, 
You don't need anybody to look down on you. You just do it all yourself. And that is true of my life. And it's probably true for some of you. I mean, in all reality, people looking down on you, I mean, I realize there's some opposition, but we're in a pretty encouraging community. And I don't think anybody is standing you telling you, you know, don't go pray for people or shut up or whatever. It's We're trying to encourage this and get this out here. But what we'll end up doing is just limiting ourselves, disqualifying ourselves, making excuses for why we can't because I'm not. Well, I'm not that way, but... And Paul says, well, what does that matter? That doesn't, that doesn't then invalidate your own giftings or what God has given you to do. I mean, I really appreciate musicians, honestly. I can't tell a horn from a note from a whatever. I have no idea. I don't know, clef note, is that something? Spark notes? I don't know. Spark. Whatever. <laughs> I really I have. <clears throat> so basically, just focus on who you are. <clears throat> Don't focus on what you're not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who am I, Lord? What have you put in my heart? What have you made me to do? Not, who, what am I not? Well, I'm not this and I'm not that. And I remember sitting with a girl at Southeastern who was sharing some problems that she was having with me and just talking about her life. And I just simply asked her, because the conversation was so negative, I was like dying inside. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, tell me three things that you're really good at. And I, she didn't know this, but I had just glanced at my watch, which I had the seconds on my watch also. And it took her over five minutes to tell me three things that she's good at. And then I said, so tell me three things you're not good at. She did it in like 15 seconds. Well, meh, meh, meh. she was so in touch with what she's not, what she's not good at, with the negative in her life, that it was clouding the positive. It was clouding the things that God had actually graced her and gifted her to do. She was called as an eye, but she was so focused on how she's not an ear that she can't see her own function, her own purpose, the things which God has placed on her. So focus on who you are rather than who you're not. And I think that that's what Paul is saying here. Let's keep reading. Yeah. I don't know if I'm supposed to Roll with But I think something that on that you were saying <coughs> comparison always kills and I like totally agree with that and I don't know if this is like a girl phrase but girls say like comparison I maybe mean, it's I don't know it's the Bible I don't know comparison is the thief of all joy same with her that before yeah is it in the Bible it's not a, it's not a scripture but okay. that's true but anyway like my roommate in my freshman year in Tennessee in college wrote that on our mirror compared to the thief of all joy and I was like oh that's true you know thought about it and I feel like all the time when we think about like comparison killing the life inside of us it's about you know oh I'm not as good of a singer as yada yada but I think we never really talk about the comparison of wow I'm actually like a lot better than you at this like, <laughs> <laughs> this is making me feel pretty good <laughs> like I am a, a lot but then that is killing you on the inside just as much as being like, oh, I'll never be like that. It's killing relationship and your dependence on God and yeah. puffing up your pride if you're comparing mm -hmm. and saying, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, even just in life, if, you know, your roommate, whatever, did, you know, and you're like, oh, man, I didn't do that. I'm, you know, I'm getting a lot better. I'm doing, you know, I spend time with Lord every morning and he just kind of like doesn't do anything. Like, you know, just remembering that comparison can go both, like, is bad either way, even if it's, like, making you feel better about yourself. Amen. That's where I was going next, so. <laughs> Proverbs 11.1 1 says that a false measure, this is Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false measure or a false standard or a false weight is an abomination to the Lord. It really does bother him. Don't compare yourself to anyone other than Jesus. That's the standard. It's easier to compare yourself to others because when you compare yourself to Jesus, you'll always fall short and you'll have to walk in humility and you'll need His grace and strength. So let's keep reading. <clears throat> we left off at verse 20. So let's start reading in verse 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, 
It is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on those we bestow more abundant honor. And our unseemly members come to have more abundant seemliness, whereas our seemly members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. The third thing that I noted here is to acknowledge our need for others, which this would then flow right into the category of not comparing yourself to other people and their gift to lord it over them because really you need them. They might not be as good at something as you are in one particular area, but likely it's your pride and you're highlighting a low point for them and a high point for you. And We need each other. We can't say to each other, I have no need of you. I mean, I, I honestly think that this would change the entire body of Christ if we actually sincerely looked at our brothers and sisters and said, I need you. There's something inside of us that doesn't like it because we want to be independent, not only of God, but also of God's people. I don't need you. I don't. I don't. And the truth is that we do. We do need each other. And it's healthy to say that. It's healthy to admit that in verse 25, that there would be no division in the body. Paul understands that the Holy Spirit reveals to him that the danger in this is division. That when we start looking around, when we start comparing, whether it's high or low, whether it's positive or negative, it always brings division. I was reading today earlier in 1 Corinthians and it struck me. Paul's writing and he says that one man gives the increase. I'm sorry, one man sows, one man waters, but God gives the increase. And then the next verse says, but they're nothing. But they are nothing. And I read an article today of somebody that was writing, and basically the whole purpose of the article was to write about how great and wonderful their, someone in their family's ministry was and how they never got any credit for it. And they want the whole world to know how awesome this person's ministry was. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, but they are nothing. And whether we get the credit or not on this earth, it doesn't matter. The Lord Jesus is the one who judges the fruit and the Father is the vine dresser. So, I mean, honestly, I think, and I'm preaching to myself, we would all accomplish a lot more if we stop worrying about who gets the credit for what is done. Because your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And if we really believe that, we'd probably do way more stuff in secret. I mean, honestly, I read a quote the other day that said something along the lines of, you know, your flesh will resist you in doing something good, but your flesh will writhe and will totally oppose you if you do something good in secret. And that's the thing of it's challenging the motive of the heart, and that's the reason why Jesus encouraged everything from praying to giving to all be done in secret because He's a God of the heart and He wants real fruit in our life and in what we're doing. So it's given to us for the benefit, for the good of others, for the profit of them. Comparison kills both ways and then it's healthy to acknowledge our need for others. The last place that I want to go real fast is just in Hebrews 3. I just want to finish <clears throat> with this encouragement. And then we can... Close up shop. Hebrews 3, and I want to read, I want to start reading in verse 7. And we're going to read. <clears throat> Would anybody else like to read like Hebrews? You're going to read Hebrews 3, 7 through 13. Right, Go ahead, okay, Hebrews 3, 7 through 13. <clears throat> 
Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of the trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me, and saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So I have quoted this scripture in part many times, encourage one another daily. Exhort one another in the Lord. The Greek says to constantly be encouraging one another always, daily. And for whatever reason, I totally missed the context of this scripture, which opened up my eyes to the power of encouragement. And what we just read is all about what? Not entering the Father's rest, having an unbelieving, sinful, pernicious, hard heart, and then he drops in there, but encourage one another daily, lest your heart be turned away by the deceitfulness of sin. And the most important thing when you read Scripture, Hermeneutics 101 is context. Where is it at? What's going on in the passage? So the writer to the Hebrews, this is all about a hardness of heart, and then he drops in there, but encourage one another daily. Why? Because the power of encouragement is that it has a softening quality that brings a softness that touches our heart. And encouragement itself is a preventative against becoming hard and becoming sinful in your heart. And this is the very reason why isolation itself is so dangerous. Because when you isolate yourself from others, you also limit the encouragement of others and you are therefore more likely to become hardened in your heart because you're not being encouraged. And again, back to the original point. We need each other. And we need to encourage one another daily. And the last thing I'll throw in here is that encouragement is a supernatural thing. It is a part of the character and nature of God. There is no such thing as being a more encouraging person than somebody else. No, we make a choice to be an encouragement to other people. It's something that we all have to choose and work at. Encouragement is not a gift, it is a choice. So being an encouraging people, learning how to notice people when they're doing something good, something right, and it's not to flatter somebody, but to say, hey, I do notice you and you're working hard or you're doing a good job, or I know right now in this season you have a lot on your plate and I just wanted to encourage you. I know you already know this. And see, encouragement doesn't have to be this new revelation that you got out of whatever. But it's a good reminder. Hey, I just wanted to remind you that the Lord's with you. That He's always, always with you through whatever you go through. That He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. I mean, honestly, I have for, you know, for whatever reason, I have maybe whatever you want to call it, cracked people more through encouraging them than like, you know, a word of knowledge. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you in my own life, in my own experience, encouraging people and being a source of just sound positivity and you're not flattering them and you're not making up stuff to the point of, but there's power in encouragement and we have to work at being an encouraging people in our hearts, actually stepping out and talking to someone and rather than calling them on the carpet, we should start calling people higher yeah. and encouraging them. You know, people that are always looking to rebuke other people, that stuff drives me nuts. <laughs> what if we just look to encourage each other? And I'm not saying we're like blind to sin and all that kind of stuff. People always want to push it to the extreme, but take it at face value. Encourage one another, lest you be given to a hard, sinful heart. There's a softening quality. There's a power that is released from the Holy Spirit to our brothers and sisters when we choose to encourage each other. And all of that is for the strengthening of the body, 
All of it is for our gifts, our callings, our talents. I mean, part of the prophetic is the Lord reveals gifts and things and callings and talents that are on other people that, frankly, people are blind to. They're like, hey, I didn't know that about myself. Or I maybe they just barely a little bit had a tiny inkling, but they were so afraid. And you call that out and you say, hey, I see this on you. The Lord has shown this to me about you. And that unlocks all kinds of courage and boldness and strength to be who God has made you to be rather than to focus on who you're not or what you're not. So that's my encouragement to us tonight is every joint supplies. What does the Lord put in your heart? What's He doing in your life? What are the things that He's actively working in you? Share it with somebody. We would do a little better to be more talkative in a positive kind of way. <laughs> so, Lord bless you. Does anybody have anything to add? I do, brother. I am chomping at the bit. You do not understand. On the way home tonight, I was listening to Joy FM, something that was on there. And they were talking about gifts of the Spirit in kind of a roundabout <coughs> way. They were talking about airline pilots and, and stewardess, or what do they call them, flight attendants? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, flight attendants <laughs> and the mechanic. And he said, you know, the, the pilot probably knows a little bit about the mechanics of a plane. The mechanic can probably teach you how to <coughs> exit the plane in an emergency if he had to. But that's not their jobs. Their jobs, that's the flight attendant's job. The mechanic's job is to make sure the plane's flyable. The pilot's job is to fly the plane. And, and it was just a short little snippet, and it, and it asked this question, what is your gift? What is your job? Do it. And, you know, Paul, I think you hit the nail on the head when you were talking a little bit about we're always looking at other people and trying to compare ourselves and say, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. I wish I could be like that person. Because look how good they are at that. And, and God just wants us to find out what our giftings are. And, and by the way, that is not rocket science. I mean, I don't, I don't even want to get off on that. But it's, it's, it's very simple. What, do you, what, is, what is innate in you? What is in you that you like to do? That's not just there. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God who has planted himself in you. If you're a Christian... It's there. It's there. I, if you don't know what your giftings are, go ask your best friend. They'll tell you. They'll tell you in a heartbeat. Well, you're, you're a servant. That's what you do. Every time somebody needs something, you go do that. Well, you're a giver. I Man, look at you. You're always giving this person five bucks or that person ten bucks or whatever. You're a giver. You know, you're prophetic, man. And anyway, ask your friends. Ask your if you have spouses. Ask your spouse. Your spouse will tell you what it is, if you don't know. And, uh...